So, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about how we came to be uh, serving in NetLake. We've been in NetLake for, six, it'll be six years in August. And my wife, uh, Natasha, is a Lutheran pastor's kid. And she grew up moving from place to place her whole upbringing. She's never lived anywhere no longer than six years. Come August, this will be a first for her. And, uh, and we're so blessed to be in that lake. Um, so uh, I was uh, graduated from seminary, and my first pastorate was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Edgewood Baptist Church. And our senior pastor, Mark Larson, he said, we're spending too much on uh, mission trips. Uh, you know, you take a week mission trip and you spend all this money and charter a bus. They were just, it was, it was not efficient. He said, call this number. We're going to try to get more for our missions buck. So he gives me Wally Olson's number. Some of you know that name. And so I didn't, but I called Wally. Wally said, okay, if you want to serve on our reservations, uh, we want a three-year commitment. And so that's how it started for me. Um, I took our youth group up to the uh, Northwest Angle Reserve in Canada. So we drove 13 and a half hours from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, all the way up to, to Canada. And we served there and did vacation Bible schools. So that's kind of how I got introduced to uh, what was going on, on na- in Native communities. Uh, later on, I uh, took a position in 2006 at First Baptist Roseau. And at First Baptist Roseau, we were close to that same uh, reserve, Northwest Angle Reserve. So I continued to serve there, as well as leading youth mission teams uh, to the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, the Crow Reservation in uh, Montana, and the Sioux Reservation in uh, South Dakota. Have any of you kids ever gone on a short-term mission trip? Have you? Okay. You have? One has? A couple of them have? And so that was kind of uh, my experience there, just short little dips into Native communities. But then uh, we were at a Sweetheart retreat, and uh, I know that uh, Pastor Randy and and, and, uh, his wife were there. And uh, Rob Boyd, uh, because of my experience on those short-term trips, Rob said, would you consider going to Net Lake to be the pastor? Because now uh, Kevin Lassley and Kathy had uh, uh, moved on, and so there was a need. And so that's how we... We got involved in the first place, and so, like I say, now we've been there for six years. It's a wonderful place. I want to show you some pictures. Uh, This is our church building. Usually when I go and speak at churches, someone in the congregation will say, I helped build that. Is there anyone here? Okay, well, that's a first. A lot of the um, people uh, uh, from the conference here have gone and just helped out. Uh, It was put up about, I think, 16 or 17 years ago. it's a, it's a wonderful building that we meet in every Sunday and Wednesday night. This is our Easter service. Uh, we had a pretty good attendance that day. Normally we might have 25 people on a Sunday morning. I think we probably had more like 40 on Easter Sunday. So it's just, it's, Net Lake is a small community, uh, between two and 300 people. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, no one finds Net Lake unless you're looking for it because we're off the beaten path. So if you know where Virginia, does anyone know where Virginia, Minnesota is? Then you go north to Cook, and then north of Cook you go to Orr. Are you still tracking with me? Okay, and then Orr, 20 miles west on a, on a little two-lane called Highway 23, and then you'll, you'll arrive in Net Lake. So that's where we're at. Um, but a great uh, community, and, uh, and I'm, I'm pastoring the church. My wife and I are, are doing what we always do. It's just that we're doing it in Net Lake. And so there's uh, challenges there because... Um, it's called the same. We have the same language, but um, there's a different culture, and so there's some some barriers there. Our prayer has been, Lord, please give us favor here, um, in spite of ourselves, because we know we're going to step on some toes, not meaning to, but just because there are cultural differences, and so. Uh, as we try to learn and listen and understand uh, the, the people, uh, sometimes we just, because we're raised in a different culture, uh, we don't mean to, but we can, uh, you know, uh, cause offense. But the Lord has so answered that prayer, and He's given us uh, favor among the people. And uh, uh, just a wonderful uh, congregation to serve. We have people of all ages, just like this congregation. A couple of our elders, uh, Mary Bell Isham and uh, Mary Plesha, and this was for their 80th birthday party. And so uh, they're uh, just uh, wonderful elders in the church. This is Janice Connor. Janice uh, leads, uh, teaches the children's message on Sunday mornings at Net Lake Baptist Church. Um, not every Sunday, but some Sundays when we have a, a, a good group of kids there, she'll teach them a little children's lesson. 
Here we have uh, some of the kids at the church from the youth group, and this is just a Christmas program, uh, getting ready, uh, practicing their lines. Um, a big part of ministry uh, in, in our community is that teams come. When, when we brought a team up from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Wally Olson said, you've got to commit to three years. You can't just come once and never come again because so much of the ministry is about relationship building and it takes time to build trust. So we say that too to teams that want to come. We want a long-term commitment for that very same reason. This particular team uh, from Rogers, Minnesota, Northridge Fellowship, they've been coming four, between four and five times a year for the last eight years. They've really taken a hold of that. And so as a result, they know everyone on a first-name basis. They're getting to know people not just in the church but outside the church. And just that continuous coming uh, really helps to break down the walls. People really get a sense that, hey, you're here, you're here for us for the long haul. And so people begin to open up more and more uh, to the people on the team. And so um, and, uh, they do you know, a lot of fun things with our kids when they come. They're coming actually again this weekend. So that's uh, just some of the things we do. Uh, uh, we teach a little uh, music. Uh, my wife there um, is uh, helping them to dissect a squirrel. So we do science lessons when teams come. That's good, right? Uh, the kids are really interested in that. Uh, what else? Um, we have a partnership with uh, Mokaham. Has anyone heard of the Mokaham Ministry Training Center? It's, uh, it's a training center for Native American uh, ministers. And so the team that came were all pastors in training. Um, we had natives uh, from Oklahoma and from way up in Kapkanjikum. Is that, does that sound right? Way up in northern Canada. And they all uh, preached and they uh, all also uh, worked with the kids because they're, they're just being trained in all those uh, aspects of ministry. So that's uh, another team that we work with that comes to our church. Um, these are some of the youth from our youth group. All these kids uh, come from broken homes. They all have uh, time in uh, foster care. And none of them know what it is just to have a home where both mom and dad are there. Uh, there are, in all these kids' lives, there's issues of, uh, yeah, just uh, a lack of stable, secure home life, I guess would be the way to say it. Great kids, uh, and so we, we minister uh, uh, with, with some of our youth here uh, as well. And uh, this is a couple more. We, we had a, a fellow come from the Northridge team who was a professional photographer. He took some of these, some of these uh, great pictures here. That's him. Uh, his name was Sean. And so this fellow here in his family, the mom abandoned the family uh, when the older ones were very young. And so uh, he's been a single dad to them. The kids have been in and out of foster care. His uncle Art founded the church in 1953, a guy named Art Holmes. And Art wrote a wonderful book uh, called The Grieving Indian. He's, he's kind of a well-known name in uh, ministry circles. I see some heads nodding. And... Um, and Charlie's dad, Axel Holmes, was uh, just passed away a, a short while back. He was 92 years old, Art, Art Holmes' brother, Axel. So he was uh, one of our uh, leaders in our church, World War II veteran. So these are some of the families that we work with. Um, had in, uh, in our almost six years, we've had eight baptisms, but five of them were just a few weeks ago. So that was exciting. We, we baptized uh, Dorothea, her son Tom, uh, her daughter Melita, and then two of Melita's kids who are in elementary school. So we do see, uh, I wouldn't say that it's, uh, you know, daily being added to our numbers, those who are being saved, like in the book of Acts. We pray for that. Pray for awakening throughout our community. We're asking God to just give a permeating awareness of His holiness, His in every heart, in every home in our community. And we just keep reaching out to people and showing kindness, respect, having conversations, getting to know people outside the church, and occasionally we'll be surprised. Uh, and that's what happened here with Dorothea and her family. Uh, they, uh, they all decided, and I, I was just about, I about fainted, but yeah, we're ready to go all in for Jesus Christ. And it meant a lot because some family members and others aren't too happy about this decision. And so they had to count, count the cost. Like in any, any community, um, following Jesus Christ isn't always the cool thing. 
it's not something that you know is is the the thing where people are like oh wow that's awesome and it doesn't always gain applause to say yeah I'm all in for Jesus Christ it's that way in our community as well so but they are all in and uh, they've been faithfully attending and growing in their faith so we're excited about that um, at men's ministry you might recognize those of you who've been to Trout Lake Camp this is a group of guys from our church that we took to Trout for men's retreat. Um, and one of our big events is our annual trip to something called the Warrior Leadership Summit, and it's put on by Hutchcraft Ministries. There's about, I'd say, six, 700 young Native people there. It's a Native Discipleship Conference, and we go every summer. And what a great event that is. Ron Hutchcraft is a gifted evangelist. He's, he's like Billy Graham. He has the ability when he preaches to bring people to a decision for Christ uh, in a, just a marvelous way. It's a, it's a wonderful gift. And so we see people responding to the call to follow Christ as well. There are um, native pastors from all over the country who are gifted speakers and leaders, and they, they also lead breakout sessions and speak at the Warrior Leadership Summit. We'll be going again this July, July 2 through 7. We drive through the night in that van. The tall guy there in the blue shirt, that's our, our, youth, uh, our, our lay youth leader, although he does uh, raise some support uh, for that. And uh, his name is Tom Burnett. He organizes this every year for us. We drive through the night. So on July 1st, we'll all gather. There'll probably be 20, between 20 and 30 of us. That's usually what it is. And we drive through the night down, it used to be to southern Missouri. Now it's going to be southern Illinois, close to St. Louis. So it's two hours less of driving. But we get there in the morning. Two drivers per vehicle. Everyone else tries their best to sleep. But then once you get there, it's a great discipleship conference for the next five days with a wonderful uh, native-led worship teams and speakers and uh, breakout sessions. So um, that's a very important part of our church calendar that we do each year. Let's see what else. That's us when we arrive at the conference and we get our T-shirts. And uh, that's uh, uh, a group from our area, Net Lake. Uh, and this is all the people at the conference from a couple of years ago. So it's just a powerful event. So as you're thinking about our ministry, and we can't thank you enough for your prayers and just your support and sending us mittens and hats and things, just be praying uh, for uh, people to have an awareness of their need for Jesus Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and we are seeing that. Just I know just as you're praying for your church here, that's, that's what we would ask you to pray for our church as well. And that more and more people would come to know Christ. Um, an hour away from Net Lake, every Monday night, we have uh, a home Bible study group. It's uh, hosted in Isabel Strong's home. Isabel passed away. Uh, she uh, um, now her daughter Crystal lives there and continues to host this uh, Bible study group there. So that's our, our Monday night fellowship that we have. The Boys Fort Reservation has the village of Net Lake, but then an hour away is the Lake Vermilion side of the reservation. If you look on the map and the map of Minnesota, you look at the Boys Fort Reservation, it's a square, but not all of that square is, is part of uh, the reservation. Not all of it's owned by the tribe. And then an hour away, there's this other little section that's also part of our reservation. There's a casino over there, and there's a community over there, and it's all connected, same tribal council and leadership. And so we also minister uh, over there each week. Um, and this is just a picture taken after church one Sunday when a group was up visiting. I think that's all my pictures. So I do have a message I prepared, but before I share that, does anyone have any questions about the work that is happening in Net Lake? Yeah, Glo. Yeah, and very few speak Ojibwe. And there's a, there's a reason for that, um, and it's a kind of a sad and tragic reason, which is that the official United States government and missionary policy for many decades was to... Uh, Assimilate, and that meant the eradication of culture and language. At the time, I believe it was thought to be 
this is what's best uh, for everyone because it's time to get on with get with the program because this is this is how things are now and got to kind of become American. Uh, I, the, the end result is it, it was abuse. It was tragic uh, because to take out the language is to tear the heart out of the people. And so there's only a few fluent speakers. There's a heroic effort to regain the language now. Now. Uh, Everyone can see the, the folly of the way it had been for so long. And so there's great regret there. At, at the same time, it does make it a challenge to reach out with the gospel because in many people's minds, Christianity is why we lost our language and culture, which that makes it a challenge. We do, but very few read Ojibwe and, and very few speak. So at Bemidji State University, I'd say that's like a center of trying to... It's, the language is like an endangered species, and there's a, there's a heroic effort to save it, but very few people in our reservation speak it. So is there a public school right in the area? Yes, there is. Yeah, Net Lake. It's a K through 6. So my son Owen went there um, from 3rd through 6th grade. My older kids, they couldn't when they were in high school. And I was concerned moving there, and we're... I mean, I'm 50 years old. I've never lived in a native community. I wondered, are, is my son going to be bullied because he's different? He's, you know, a white kid. But, but no, the people have been just wonderful. And he's, he's uh, been very much accepted and, and loved by his peers. So is the um, language trying to be taught in school? Yeah, yeah. One of the fluent speakers, her name's Karen Drift, and uh, she um, comes in every day and teaches the kids. The kids are little sponges, so they're, I think there's hope for the language but there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. So we're, we're very supportive of that. I mean, part of repentance is when you... I think, you know, Christian uh, missionary workers as a whole realize that that was wrong. Part of repentance then is then to turn around and do things differently. So we're just supporting all those efforts 100%. So... About... Oh, yeah, they're... Um, they pick up on it real quick, and Karen's a good teacher. So, uh, still, it's a lot of a lot of work to become fluent. It's not an easy language. So, yeah. the older people really don't put much effort into it. They're almost like that's not going to happen with them. But by focusing on the real young kids and Head Start and the younger grades, because their brains are little sponges, that's where the hope for the uh, restoration of the language really is. So that's something to be praying for as well. Yeah? They're horrible. Yeah. We have so many drug problems. Thankfully, in um, Boys Fort Reservation, I've done just one suicide funeral in six years. Uh, there's some other reservations in Minnesota where, the, where it's been really awful, uh, one after another after another. Up in Pekanjikum in Canada, there, we had those Mokahum students who came. Two of those students were from Pekanjikum. And up there, too, just one after another after another. But we do have serious drug problems in our community with methamphetamine and uh, heroin, uh, opioids, uh, alcoholism. There are, there are those challenges. I think it's safe to say that those challenges are everywhere. They're in Aiken County. They're, they're in St. Louis County. Uh, what people who work in native communities say, well, we have all the bad statistics. We just have a higher percentage of the bad statistics. So, I mean, obviously we've got serious issues all over our country with these things. So. If they aren't, um, what, what, what other religions do they practice? Oh, it's, well, it's a, the traditional uh, Ojibwe spirituality, which has to do with, um, there are um, medicine men, there's a lot of uh, natural herbal remedies, there's um, a lot of uh, contact with the spirit world through um, uh, ceremonies that are done in order for healings to take place and things like that. That's kind of the, what they call the traditional. And so sometimes we'll, we'll want to share about the Lord with someone and they'll say, I'm traditional. So I don't, you know, kind of the wall goes up. That's, that's not me. That's not my path. 
you know, okay, we respect that. Uh, so, but we still, we pray for those, for the, we pray for everybody. We want people to know Jesus. And uh, so, that's our desire. <coughs> Well, a lot of it is just to have structured activities. Like well, one of my friends who grew up in Net Lake, and she's part of our church, she said, I grew up in Net Lake, and there's never anything to do here. So when teams come, there's just structured games, there's crafts, there's uh, fun, you know, there's, uh, the kids really look forward to it. And so just having the, just the structured activities as well as little Bible training, little, little uh, lessons too. Um, Meals, food, a lot of times kids will come and they, they haven't eaten well at home. So there's, when teams come or any time, we, we try to keep the food flowing at the church because you're not sure if people are eating well at home. So, Any, any other uh, questions about uh, ministry there? On the, uh, I'm not, not that I'm an expert, but we're learning every day. And, uh, oh, I'd say 15 is a good number. And some groups are, are less than that. Uh, if you get too many, it, it's, it's, it's too much. We're, we're just a small community. If you got more on the team than, you know, people coming to serve, you end up, like, standing around. And it's counterproductive, so. So, um, thank you all again. I, I, we really uh, do. We covet your prayers. There are... Uh, and there are good things happening in the, in the ministry, and uh, we hope that uh, we can continue on there and uh, see, see the, the fruit of lives changed, just like your, your church here. That's, uh, that's our desire. So I have a little message to share, if that's okay. Sorry about all that racket. Okay, is that better? Wow. Did anyone hear a word I've said so far? Okay. I hope that doesn't uh, rub against my whiskers like Pastor Chris was saying. All right. Well, I'm just going to say a prayer, and then we'll share uh, from God's Word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we know that you are, you are present here tonight. We are grateful uh, for all that you are, all, who you are to us and all that you continuously are doing for us to help us in every challenge. So please help me in the challenge of, of preaching this message. I ask that, uh, Lord, that you'll take this little bit that I've prepared and multiply it to our hearts that each person can benefit uh, from hearing your word. Um, please apply your word to each of our hearts by your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my message is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, and it's about the Tower of Babel. And so... As an introduction, um, I was born in Chicago, and my parents are city people, and so my brothers and I, we had the benefit of doing great things in the city. We could take the uh, train down to Wrigley Field, which was my parents' idea of the great outdoors, being city people, is Wrigley Field. And um, we went down to the Loop, and we got to go to museums, and just part of who I am as a, as a city kind of a person because of who my parents are. Then at the age of five, we moved to Michigan and lived in a small town of about 40,000. And on weekends, everyone would go camping. My parents didn't know how to go camping. So we'd go into Detroit for a ball game, and that's just, that's who I am. I come. So growing up in Chicago, but Chicago is known in the United States as the second city. Who knows what is known as the first city? New York, New York right. And so I also had an opportunity at the age of 18 and 19 to live in New York for uh, eight months. And that was uh, a, a great experience. Uh, got to see wonderful concerts like Simon and Garfunkel. I was, I was present for the concert at Central Park. And a lot of great cultural experiences. And I really was just 
amazed in, uh, about what, what, what man can accomplish with skyscrapers and, and, and things like that. And that was just, I was very passionate about that as a young man. Well, in Genesis, there's also the first and the second city. The first city in Genesis is actually called Enoch. It's from Genesis chapter 4. And Cain, who is the firstborn of Adam and Eve, after he murders his brother Abel, he goes on to found a city later in life. And the city he names after his son. His son is named Enoch. And this first city was known for culture and art and technology and violence. Now in those early chapters in Genesis, there's also a second city. And that's the city that we're going to look at. The second city is called Babel. And Babel is the place where God responded to man's unified rebellion by scattering our languages. As a result of what happened at Babel, our ancestors had to separate from those whose speech they couldn't understand and unite with those whose speech they could understand. They were divided by languages, and then they spread out in every direction, populating the whole earth, developing very different cultures over time. And cultures impacts how we raise our children, how families function, how ceremonies are conducted, such as weddings and funerals, and what incredible challenges we face today because of different languages and cultures and religious beliefs. Now, Dr. Stephen Leeson, he writes, it's important to remember that these cultural and language barriers were put in place by God to slow down the rate of human rebellion and to keep human pride in check. Today, we are divided by languages and values and culture. We're often hurtful and hateful toward one another. Our politics are like one big global game of King of the Hill. Do you remember King of the Hill back in kindergarten? But God has a plan, and He is working His plan out in human history. And in the end, people from every nation and tribe and people and language will be united in the kingdom of God and in the worship of Jesus Christ. That's where this all, that's where human history is headed. But for now, let's look briefly back at what happened with our ancestors at the Tower of Babel. Oh, this is the Chicago skyline I was so excited about as a kid. I just, my heart would start pounding when we'd go visit my grandparents after we moved to Michigan and see it. And then as a, a young person, I spent some time in New York. I, I was supposed to include those slides, but I didn't. Okay, so let's read. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come. Let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. And that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. 
So that's our portion from God's Word. And I just want to divide it into the pride of man. We'll look at first. God came down. That'll be part two. And then the people are scattered. And then we'll have application as to how can we apply this to our lives. First, the pride of man. There was a great pastor who since passed away. And he was a missionary statesman from London, England, named John Stott. And here's what he said to a group of young people who were interested in serving in missions. He said, Pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. And we read about this also in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Our ancient ancestors had so much going for them. Why did it have to end in ruin? They could communicate freely, just like we can here tonight. They were immensely talented. They knew how to design and build buildings. And they were unified. These were exciting Times. Verse 1 of our section, this is from the New American Standard. Try to imagine this. It says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. If you can imagine. No one would say, I need to learn a second language in my high school for credit because no one knew what a second language even was. Way back in these ancient times. It's... Difficult for us to imagine. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now this area is known to archaeologists and historians in Mesopotamia as the Fertile Crescent. God had told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth. But they liked their Fertile Crescent. And they were disinclined to obey God. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And this was a new technology. There was so much more you could do with bricks. The sky's the limit. Now there's there's nothing wrong with wanting to accomplish amazing things by cooperating with others. Utilizing the talents that God has given us. But in the case of our ancient ancestors, their motivation was all wrong. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Make a name for ourselves literally means to bring glory to ourselves. And to resist being scattered over the face of the whole earth was to resist God's will. God had said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So with the amazing talents that God had given them, they were building a city and a tower, but they were dedicating it to their own glory and not to God's. And they were also defying God's command to spread out and populate the whole earth like He had told them. So what did the tower look like? Most Bible scholars believe that the tower looked something like this. And the Tower of Babel may have been the first, but towers like this are found all over the world. In fact, I think I have a slide here. This is in our time zone, but you have to go south. You have to go beyond Texas, and then you have to go all the way through Mexico. But when you get into northern Guatemala, there's this structure. And so, um, this is something of what the Tower of Babel looked like. And the people were caught up in the excitement of this tower project because they're sure to become famous. And the tower would be a symbol of their own power and glory. Now, do people still build these kinds of towers? Let's see. Lost my microphone. Uh oh. 
This is in the oh, this is in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. I believe this is the tallest building in the world at this moment. It's called the Burj Khalifa, the Khalifa Tower. And when a nation, sorry, when a nation has the tallest tower, it conveys status and honor. As a kid, being from Chicago, we had what was called the Sears Tower, and it was the tallest building in the world. We're very proud of that. Now, in this tower, the last, I'm sorry, too loud now. The last highest 722 feet, or something like that, are completely empty. It's called a vanity spire. Its sole purpose is to be the tallest building in the whole world. There it is at night. And, uh, yeah, it's, wow. I believe that must be a flag of the United Arab Emirates. Apparently, um, there was a leaky roof, so he went up there to... <laughs> so, it's part of a long history of these kind of buildings since the beginning of mankind. Look how it is in the New Living Translation. Come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and will keep us from being scattered all over the world. Kent Hughes, who's commented on this passage, he says this, Today this same will to fame is everywhere. It drives politicians and preachers and athletes and actors. If we can make a name for ourselves... People will esteem us, and then we will have succeeded, we think. And that's often how we think. But how does God think? So the pride of man. Next, the Lord came down. I think it's pretty safe to say that the Lord was not impressed with the Tower of Babel. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. But the Lord came down, it says. The greatest example of the Lord coming down is the life of Christ here on earth. But even in Old Testament times, the Lord came down from time to time. And this is one of those times. And the Lord saw what our ancestors were doing. He had given them time. And He had given them the freedom to explore and develop their talents. But now it had become clear that lost as they were and astray from God's will, their only ambition was for temporary fame and gain and power. And in the process of gaining their city and their tower, they were losing their souls. The Lord came down to see what our ancestors were doing. And then it says the Lord intervened. So the last section, the people are scattered Apparently, when human beings are astray from God and yet united together and ambitious, they can do a lot of damage. We can do a lot of damage. And so I believe it was for our good and in keeping with His plan for human history that the Lord intervened. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. New technologies are dangerous in the hands of human beings, united in their quest after personal power and glory. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Now, how did God do this? The Lord works in mysterious ways. Suddenly, they're working away on their big building, and they're like in a foreign movie without subtitles. Just like that. And that was the end of, the, of their tower project. And so, the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. The very thing that they feared came upon them. They said, let's 
build our city and our tower so that we won't be scattered over the face of the whole earth. The very thing they didn't want to happen is what ended up happening. And the very thing they feared is what came upon them. When we forget God, as our ancestors did, and are selfishly ambitious for our own glory, then after a certain amount of time has passed, the very thing we fear will come upon us. They wanted to make a great name for themselves, but the name that they are known to history is confusion. And that is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now what can we learn and how can we apply this to our lives? First, I believe that this is human nature apart from God. That we want to make a name for ourselves. We struggle with selfish ambition for our own personal glory. It's natural for human beings to want to be esteemed. Now, is this all bad? Consider this now from Proverbs. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. So it's not wrong to want to be esteemed. And a good name, a good reputation is more desirable than great riches. We Christ followers are just like everyone else. Christ followers want to be esteemed. How can we avoid falling into the sin of our earlier ancestors? The key is humility. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud. So there they are building the city. And it came to nothing and came to ruin. But humility comes before honor. So if we want to be esteemed, we have to humble ourselves. God opposes the proud, the scripture says, those who are arrogant, but shows favor to the humble. Now, Christians are just like everyone else. The disciples of Jesus, the Bible says they would argue about which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And Jesus, finally, when the discussion got extremely heated one day, he intervenes. And here's what he says. He called them together and he said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over them, over their people. You know the officials flaunt their authority over those under them, but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be your leader Among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that stopped their argument, and I'm sure they looked at him. They might have looked at him the way a a dog looks at his master when the master's pointing, and the dog keeps looking at the finger, but not what he's pointing at. I don't think they got what he was saying because they kept having this argument over and over again. It's so deeply ingrained in our nature. But then he goes on and he gets on his hands and his knees and he washed their feet. And then shortly after that, he went to the cross for them. And that's when it begins to hit home. And that's the thing that changed these men. And after that, their ambition was to be servants. Because this and this alone is what can break us of our pride and our selfish ambition. There was a great saint from the Middle Ages. Saint Bernard. Not the puppy. And he wrote, he said, My Jesus, when I see you so humiliated before me, how can I wish to be esteemed and honored at all. While taking a great tour back in the early 18th century, there was a man, Count Nicholas Zinzendorf. 
And he was wealthy. He was a nobleman. He was young. And he went to visit this museum in Dusseldorf. And there's thousands of paintings in this museum. But this one painting by Domenico Fetti struck him forcefully. It stopped him in his tracks. And it changed his life forever. The painting is called Behold the Man. And it presented a very human and tender Christ crowned with thorns. And across the bottom of the painting was this question. This I have suffered for you. Now, what will you do for me? Marissa Martin writes, Struck by the question and the expression of Christ that the artist conveyed in his painting, Count Zinzendorf stood frozen by the painting in sort of a daze. It seemed to single him out personally. Already a pious Lutheran, the artist's challenge continued to haunt him long after. He soon vowed to serve Christ and began an extraordinary life of service to the church and society. Zinzendorf was one of the first to campaign for the humane treatment of slaves and to honor aboriginal, indigenous, native peoples. From Zinzendorf was like the spark which came the Moravian missions movement which started something that's known as the Great Missions Century. But what was it that sparked it? It was that encounter that he had by the, I believe, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This is what can take our ambition to go out and build a name for ourselves and cause us to cast that aside and to want to be only ambitious to serve Christ. In conclusion, another one of the apostles, Paul, he was such a rising star of religion. And yet, through an encounter with Jesus Christ, he changed. And this is what he had to say. The people he used to persecute zealously in order to advance in his religion, which was against Christianity, he became to consider himself less than those people that he had once persecuted. He says, I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people. But this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles, to go into all the world and to preach the boundless riches of Christ. His only ambition then is the same one he passes on to us. And I'll, I'll close with this as a challenge to us about since we want to be great, we are competitive people. Jesus says, here's how you do it. Be a servant. Here's his words. He says to us, and all believers, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In the uh, very loose paraphrase by Eugene Peterson, it's put this way. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Words to live by. I want to challenge us tonight as Christ followers. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you. Lord, this is how we are. Lord, we're all about our own stuff until we see Jesus Christ who washes our feet and goes to the cross for us. I pray, Lord, for each here that, Lord, you'll reveal yourself in this very same way to us. That we will be all about the esteem of your name and serving you humbly all our days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, thanks everyone. Uh, for your love and support for us up in Net Lake, and we appreciate it very much. I think, come on, Ruth. Oh, that's fine. Purple. There we go. Uh, I think before we let you go, we'll pray for you and your ministry as well. And then I think Kevin will probably be around for a little while as you have. Uh, so desired, come up and chat with him and hang out, and uh, you got about a 
three mile drive. I lived in that house for a little while, so I know where you're going. So you don't have any hurry to get there, other than it's a beautiful view you'll be missing tonight. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, let's pray for Kevin and the Net Lake and all the work that's going on there. And then uh, we'll call it an evening and get out of here. Father God, we do thank you for Kevin and uh, his wife and family and their dedication and willingness to go where you send. And sometimes, Lord, uh, sending is the other side of the world to far off and distant places. But sometimes, Lord, those far off and distant places are actually in our own backyard. And so, uh, God, we thank you for brave men and women who heed your calling, who are willing to go and, and, and work in difficult places. Uh, the challenges, Lord, uh, can sometimes seem vast, but God, you have sent the right people. And we are thankful that we can partner with them and pray, God, for uh, just a flourishing of their ministry there that, uh, you know, for your glory, your, the numbers there would be multiplied, that more and more people would come to know, love, and serve you, would hear the gospel, would hear the truth, would hear your love, that people would know that God loves them. And that through this ministry, Lord, that that would just make a difference in this world and in this eternity. So, God, we thank you again for the words we heard tonight, for the time that we've had together, for the blessing you've poured into our lives. Uh, may we continue to uh, have opportunity to share that blessing with others. Uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.